Greetings, friends. Uh, I'm Dr. Naufal from Conceptual Orthopedics, and uh, today we have uh, Professor Dr. S. M. Tulisar with us to discuss about the neurological examination in orthopedics. So, uh, as orthopedicians, I think uh, neurological examination should be part and parcel of your daily OPD basis examination and even in the wards. So, sir will be talking about the importance of neurological examination and will be uh, focusing on a few points of neurological examination, which you have to keep in your daily practice so sir a few words about the importance of neurological examination and then we'll start today's session as orthopedicians looking after the patients we must be ready to diagnose and treat many neuromuscular disorders for the whole life after all orthopedics is a subject which takes care of one of the most important thing which we do is my patient should be a walker. Patient has come to me, but I would see that I am able to treat the patient so that my patient is ambulatory. He is able to look after himself in mobility, in able to eat with his own hands. He can have a cup of tea in his own hand and he is able to write. All this comes under neurology. Some of the very catchy things, some people have called it glass diagnostics. You look at the patient and you can make a diagnosis. See? Similarly, the same formula, listen, look, feel, move, mayor, compare. That basic formula as taught to us by our founder for fathers of orthopedics, it applicable today. Listen to the patient. Did all this happen? What he is coming to you? Did it happen after an injury? After an injection into a particular area? Or was it the outcome after an operative repair? Do keep it in mind. Any patient who faces a polytraumatic condition, say on the roadside, 30% of them have damage to the vertebral column. So these are the things which you will be know only if you listen to the patient. He says, sir, I had an accident and after that my foot is not working. We have yes. Yes. Look, let's look at the patient. The patient is walking with the so-called high stepping gait. He is not able to clear the ground. You know, when we walk, our walk has two phases. I think that we must understand. One is a stance phase and the other is a swing phase. The stance phase is when some part of the foot is touching the ground. It goes from heel touch to toe off. This is what we say stance phase. Once the toe is off, till it touches the heel again, and that is called the swing phase. You can watch a patient walking. He's taking high steps. Why he's taking high steps? That's called high stepping gait. He's taking the high step because probably he has a foot drop. He cannot dorsiflex the foot. He cannot touch the heel first on the ground. He touches the toes on the ground. These are small things which have been given the name of glance diagnostics. But we can understand these things only. If you have been watching, look at the people who walk into your OPD. Look at the people who sometimes you can see in a social gathering. It is true that today the smart generation has smartphones, tablets. Let's use these computers to optimize our knowledge, optimize our diagnosis, optimize the treatment. Similarly, let us say the patient has a wrist drop. It, it's visible from a distance, you know. He is wanting to hold a glass. He cannot. He just letting the wrist hang down. So this is called a wrist drop. And the commonest cause of wrist drop is a damage to the radial nerve. Now again, with some understanding, we know where does a radial nerve get damaged? It can be behind the humerus or it can be around the radial neck deep to the supernatural muscles. So, 
So we could, on a glance diagnostic, we could judge that there is a foot drop, there is a wrist drop, the patient has a flail shoulder and the whole upper limb is internally rotated. He is walking with a flail shoulder, almost helpless shoulder. The whole limb is internally rotated. The palm is looking backwards. Somehow it has been given the name of a waiter accepting a tip. That's the word used, waiter accepting a tip. So these are some of the things which one can say, so-called chance glance diagnostics. Then there are some motor weaknesses which occur without sensory loss at all. Broadly speaking, today poliomyelitis is not commonly seen, but poliomyelitis is a condition. There is a severe motor weakness, but the sensations are there. What? How can you do that? Patient. Muscles are paralyzed, but the sensations are there. See? Efferent fibers have not been damaged, whereas efferent fibers have been damaged. No, where does the efferent fiber start from? It starts from anterior horn cells downwards. In poliomyelitis, it is the anterior horn cell that gets damaged. So the muscle gets paralyzed, but the sensation is not paralyzed. So this is how one learns why differentiate. Similarly, that's a muscular dystrophy. Patient is not, patient may have such a severe status of muscular dystrophy, he is not able to walk. Muscles look prominent, but he is not able to walk. But the sensation is there. Again, the defect is in the muscle substance itself. These are some of the things which will help you possibly so-called glance diagnostic. You're looking at the foot and you find that there is an ulcer under the heel. What is that ulcer? It looks like a trophic ulcer. The heel has got an ulcer. The patient has been walking. Because there was no protective sensation, so an ulceration has taken place. What is the condition which produces so-called trophic ulcer? Well, one of the conditions in our country is diabetes. But it can also happen if the peripheral nerve is damaged like sciatic nerve damage or posterior tibial nerve, the tibial nerve damage. The, both of them can cause trophic ulcers. This is, we will keep on looking at these things and learn how to make a diagnosis. Another thing which you should keep in mind, the damage can be where? The damage can be at the anterior horn cell. The damage can be in the Efferent fibers, the damage can be in the spinal cord. Which part of spinal cord? We generally count the spinal segments. The damage may be in the spinal segments above the level of, let us say, S1. The damage can be below the, uh, below the level of S1, which will give you something like a cardioquina syndrome. It damage to the cardiaquina syndrome essentially causes loss of bladder and bowel control and saddle anesthesia. Another thing which we come across in orthopedic practice is so-called nerve tunnel syndromes. A nerve passing through a narrow passage can get entrapped or irritated or damaged in that tunnel. One of the examples is ulnar tunnel syndrome. Ulnar nerve passes through a tunnel behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. That tunnel can get damaged due to, let us say, injury, infection, or sometimes just by scarring. The ulnar nerve will get irritated, produce ulnar nerve neuritis and paralysis, creating a ulnar claw hand. Similarly, radial nerve can get damaged it is, as it is passing through the canal behind the humerus, in the middle of the humerus, behind the, behind the humerus. Another place where radial nerve can get paralyzed is when the deep nerve, radial nerve is passing through supinator muscles around the radial neck. And then we call 
posterior uh, intraosseous nerve paralysis, again giving a wrist drop. Similarly, there are two or three more places, like common ones are carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel is situated in front of the carpal bones, but deep to the flexor retinaculum, where the median nerve is mostly involved because of the narrowing, what is called median nerve paralysis due to carpal tunnel syndrome. At the same place, sometimes even the ulnar nerve can get involved because that place may be narrow. Ulnar nerve passes through a canal. It has been given the name, you see. It has been given the name of Goyne's canal. And the Goyne canal can also get narrowed and create another ulnar nerve paresis. Another nerves in the lower limb. They come to the lower limbs. In lateral